Hello, everyone, and welcome to another guitar talk. Um, again, of course, if you've already been following me, um, maybe about improvisation on guitar, um, which I, I kind of consider open to to any genre. Um, but um, we're, of course, heavily influenced by um, jazz and that's kind of what we're mainly uh, focused on here so sort of the, the jazz tradition guitar and uh, so I'll do a little warming up here and uh, so this is part of the uh, member area on YouTube which has been going now for almost a year I think um, maybe 11 months now. So it's been really exciting. It's been really awesome. Um, we've been growing a, a really good community of folks. Um, and we've been featuring um, in the last month or so uh, one of the member videos, um, uh, podcast edition. So today, on Fridays, usually I do a weekend review for all members and just kind of do a review and a little question and answer. So um, we a little early today. It's 10 a.m. on um, Friday, January 14th. And uh, so I'm not sure how, much, how many folks will join in, but uh, we'll see how it goes. And these are always available for replay. So it's kind of a, a live stream video. So, and a podcast. So that's also a benefit to, to members. You can take, take the talk in, uh, in your car or out on a walk, whatever you're doing with a device um, or wherever you're taking a device, I should say. So um, let me warm up a little bit here. Um, maybe I'll I'll do real something really slow on um, on confirmation. So I, I that's a one kind of member update thing. I, I'm working on doing these shorts, and um, it was really um, quite astounding how many views that um, that short had this week. Um, confirmation. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about about that one. So one of the things when when chords are changing, one. So I just played about halfway through the the A section there, or maybe a little more, um, somewhere around there. Anyway. So um, how do we connect, you know, we want to have this awareness of the key that we're in. So we're in F. We want to have this kind of awareness of the chord changes, right? So we have basically a five of the six chord. And then we have a little movement ahead of that. So we have like a two five to the six chord. So, you know, when you're playing, you know, one thing I've, I've really recommended here uh, quite a bit is to have maybe four notes that you can play on a given chord sound. So let's say we say, if we say have that for F. Okay, and then we say, how do we connect that to to this next chord. So we might say, that's kind of a, a nice sound on that on that chord, the um, E minor seven flat five to play the 11, because we're already on this note. So that's a, you know, it's kind of thinking about how, how can you connect your line. So one thing that you can do is, is take four notes and see if you can do maybe a stepwise motion into into a note to start out your next chords. 
So let's say we have something like that. Okay. All right. So then you can kind of say, okay. Now, one line that I just played a moment ago, I think something like this. Perspectives you can take on that. So let's say we're say we're thinking about this A7. So this note is the flat nine. We say to the flat seven, and maybe we're gonna target this G when we get to the or A rather, excuse me, A when we get to this D chord. That works pretty well, right? And then we have this chromatic tone that's just going to lead up. Sometimes you can take different perspectives on on some of these things and think, okay, um, am I going to? And, and you can have one one line and like kind of kind of take this sort of um, perspective, you know? Say, okay, what's the um, have kind of a bebop sort of sort of scale there on A. Right? So you can say, oh, maybe that's coming out out of that, or maybe we're just encircling this tone. So different perspectives on these on these things. Um, so when we um, play a solo. And improvise in the in the moment. It's a little bit. Um, let's say we don't really want to deliberately think about these things so much, um, but our awareness can be very quick. So thinking is, you know, you might say maybe a little reserved more for the practice part of of things. And then, of course, we try to keep our awareness level um, as high as we can uh, when practicing. But um, when we're improvising, kind of trying to shut off the thinking, critiquing element of it. And we're, we're trying to really kind of go into the more um, open awareness and and non-critical sort of so, sort of thinking um, not thinking so thinking not thinking so we, we say you know we try to you know and as soon as you and this might not be the experience for you but i would say it's probably pretty universal but as soon as you start thinking about someone listening and critiquing like someone else or yourself listening and critiquing um you're probably gonna slip up and make a mistake because you've introduced a gap okay so when we when we go into the playing element of things we um we work with awareness so where you know playing kind of comes in and i think that's that's a good aspect of our um our um you might say um our relationship with the instrument and uh music is to is to spend time playing and to spend time practicing and think about am i practicing now or am I playing right now? There might be some some middle ground or some switching back and forth. But um, when it comes to to practice, just try to make it deliberate, slow. So you're trying to take the the thinking aspect of of that process 
and you're gonna try to let that like kind of trickle in deeper into into the awareness level so we say okay i want to deliberately work on um you know so for example one thing i was working on or thinking about a little bit earlier this week just on my my own practice time which i i, I think i'm gonna do a video on it but um is the process of uh leaving a string and i may have talked about this before you know so how do we leave the string? Okay. Do we just take the finger off? So you see if I do that, I'm getting some open strings ringing out. So you could deliberately practice, okay, I'm gonna take the take the note, pluck it. I'm gonna release tension. Finger's still on the string and then remove it. And then I think, okay, do I remove it over this way? Maybe so how, what is it like to, to move over this way and away from the string or this way? You know, what is the result of that? You know, is it, maybe it's no, no different. Or what if I try to perceive I'm moving out and up from the string? or out and down, you know, and what is the result of that? So you might find this no different, or you might find, oh, maybe I'm catching the string a little bit on my finger. If I, if I move it down, maybe I'm, and then inadvertently playing an open string. You probably heard that. So we can, we can take these very deliberate and slow steps really thinking about things, you know, really, really trying to hit every angle, trying to um, come up with an idea. Does, does this matter? Does this matter? Um, and, and you can see such a, a little, um, a little topic like that. Uh, how does my finger part ways with a string? Um, and so that's a little bit of what practice ideas and um, concepts is is partly about um it's also it's basically obviously about practicing but um it's also about taking small amounts of information and um and working working at it um so we spent some time this week exploring similar similar to what i just did there, um, which is exploring range. So that's something, and I think that was a podcast edition too. Um, so exploring um, the range, you know, take one little specific thing and say, okay, this is the lowest note and this is the highest note. And then, you know, we talked about maybe going in the opposite direction and saying, okay, this is, this is very narrow range. If we if we limit ourselves to one one note and we kind of move over this direction, right? Then that's very that's like there's no range there, really, right? So interesting, right? Because we're we're drawing this diagonal from this direction, and then the opposite diagonal, we see that we have quite a lot of range if we start moving up. So we say, okay, we did some things with octaves. Okay, so moving up an, an octave um, at a time and just going over to the next string. And then we spend some time looking at um, an octave up from there and just doing that up, up, the, up the strings. So, um, so that's that's part of taking taking the instrument and saying I'm not doing any um, especially distracting kinds of things like um, checking out social media or you know maybe 
completely apart from a screen, you know, a screen's nowhere nearby. And, and then you're saying, yeah, I don't even have sheet music. Maybe there's a music stand, but you know, no sheet music. And just, I'm just going to spend time on this instrument, exploring it a little bit. Um, but some other things that we did, um, did use some, some of the, um, and of course you could practice that along with the video, but, um, but you could take the ideas of the video and then, you know, sit, um, sit and work some of these things things out. Uh, but another another thing in practice ideas and concept uh, was taking one string and one octave and dividing up into different arpeggios, right? So that we could decide, you know, we can really see in a linear way how things work, you know. So one limiting yourself to one string and then moving up. Now these frets are spaced different amounts, so that we have that factor. Um, but it is linear, linear, right? Then we have a line here, string. So we can think in terms of um, one uh, one sort of plane, I guess you could say really plain, but um, one line anyway. So um, yeah, so we explored um, that quite a bit. And then we did take some time to check out some scales. So um, on overview and analysis, we looked at a couple of different players uh, playing um, the um, uh, Body and Soul, which is our featured tune this week. So we looked at Kenny Burrell, and we got some chord melody things going, and we looked at Oscar Moore um, and just sampled a little bit of those. But one thing we saw with, um, with some of the uh, Kenny Burrell uh, voicing, so his, his was more of a chord melody sort of voicing. I think we saw this one come up. So, so we thought, okay, well, we investigated that a little bit in an overview and analysis. So, um, you know, what, what kind of scale might that fit? You know, we have A flat, 13, flat nine. You know, what on earth kind of scale would, would fit that? And one that, that works, if you think about the tonic chord, D flat here, and you take the scale called the harmonic major. Okay, so it sounds a little bit like the steps, the higher part of the harmonic minor. But notice we have a major third. So if we apply that to the five chord, and this is what's one thing that's really interesting about those harmonic minor and harmonic major scales is they are definitely applicable to to the name of the um, tonic that we that we're, that we're naming here, like D flat. But they're it's very worthwhile to explore how how they are in different degrees of that scale, and one in particular, um, the five chord. So we could say, oh, okay, so A flat is this natural thirteen. So a harmonic. A, a D flat harmonic minor is not it's not going to apply there, but um, this harmonic major will. So all we need to do is take that from from the perspective of this of this note, and you can run a, a scale through it. So it's just like mixolydian with a flat, except it, that it has a flat nine, right? And then this starts to make a lot of sense. Okay, so we wrote out a pattern basically, just like just like that. Um, we, we talked about Ionian and just kind of explored that in that area. So a small bit of information there, and we have different exercises on that. And then thinking about the D flat harmonic major, 
um, applied to 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 this chord, which gives us that mixolydian flat nine. And we also talked a little bit about the moment where it goes to minor. And actually, we we talked about some pentatonic scales too. So tie that in there. So. Um, So we talked about the um, minor six pentatonic. And then tie that into the five chord, which we could use the B flat harmonic minor. And then we can apply that to the five chord. So very similar to what we did earlier. So then. Not only do we have the flat nine like we had on the other example, but we have a flat 13 as well, which helps us not conflict with the um, minor aspect of B flat. So those are um, a few things and practice ideas and uh, concepts. Uh, we didn't get to a practice along, but I, I did, did keep the... Um, the talks um, kind of in that vein where we, we would play along with them. We should have a practice along next, next week. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about what we did in overview and analysis before we, um, before we go on here. So um, On, the, on these series of, of videos, what we're aiming to do is try to take a look at, one of the main features is um, trying to take a look at as some playing by um, prominent musicians, uh, past and, and present. So um, we took a look at uh, Kane Burrell, like I said, and Oscar Moore and got some some ideas on what they um, played and um, really tied in pretty heavily to uh, the melody on uh, this week. But we also, of course, take a look at um, improvised solos. Um, there is some improvisation. There are some improvisation elements in that, though, um, um, in how they uh, played the, the melody. Um, but we also work to... Um, understand the chord changes, which this is in incredibly important. Um, you want to, or I'm not going to tell you what you want to do, but <laughs> I would, I would uh, recommend, highly recommend that you, if you haven't already, Try to get beyond, oh, I put my fingers here, and then I put my fingers here, and then I do this, you know. Part of one of uh, the themes in, in my um, teaching efforts, and this has gone back to when I first started teaching guitar, um, over 20 years ago, was... I wanted folks to become independent from from the lesson, um, and and that that didn't mean that, and it still doesn't mean that um, folks should just get it and then like move away from lessons. I think it's important to continue continue lessons um you know unless unless you become a total virtuoso and um you kind of um move to that level but um but kind of the you know working with arrangements um is great and I've done a lot of that and I've recorded videos of of me doing specific arrangements like um I've grown accustomed to her face, that arrangement by uh, Wes Montgomery, 
um, Travels, where I, I played it pretty much just like uh, Pat Metheny. So there, I feel there's definitely a, a space for that. Um, um, and part of my motivation doing those videos is that so someone could really see the specifics and the details of those things so that they could take it from there and make it their own and improvise with it so you have a, a solid foundation so even even in those circumstances um you know i'm not trying to set out to make it like a classical piece that you play you know in a certain way and you interpret strictly through dynamics or tempo changes and things like that um, so even those i'm really trying to give folks um, a jumping off point and my efforts in that is to make things as specific and accurate as I possibly can because um, learning guitar and learning tunes myself um, I, underst I understand this process of going through recordings and having no visual information at all right so that's sort of a tough a tough thing um, so you're just like it's all strictly ear and i think there is a, a space for that in one's practicing as well but it's incredibly helpful to see a visual and it probably makes learning some things really fast so um so there's that that kind of trade-off on that but um so anyway i'm not getting on too much of a tangent but anyway sort of the idea of you know being able to especially improvise maybe some you know experiment with some kind of cool chords Melody, you kind of get this. But anyway, I wasn't really playing chord melody there, but but you know, to have fun with it and just say, okay, I can work with that awareness because I spent the time analyzing that tune and I could, you know, maybe put it in a totally different key, you know, maybe, maybe put it in G. You know, and moving from there. So that's a that's you know kind of a very powerful thing, and that's that's one of the things that we're trying to work at, um, especially, um, well, really everything, really all the all the tiers. So so we spend some time analyzing the chord progression, which is so immensely important. So I would say if you get to one video um, in the course of the week, I would recommend doing you know one of the like chord progression kind of kinds of videos um where you uh, work out work that out so um and then we talked about on a on another level or similar to the harmonic progression which is um knowing and and being able to identify how a chord relates to um, to a melody, or how a melody relates to a chord. I'm gonna try not to set off any um, copyright things here. So. Um, so I don't play too much of that, but I do get copyright notices and things if I play melodies with the rhythm, depending on the on the tune. But um, so anyway, we went through and explored the um, you know being able to having that goal of being able to identify the um, the um, tone, and that's where 
you know, some of these topics kind of inspire some of the um, video content for um, for some of the other tiers like um, practice ideas and concepts and um, uh, theory and fingerboards. So we had a really, I think, very important talk um, this past week on secondary dominance, and it's a two it's a two part series. Um, and um, that's partly inspired just by uh, analyzing the tune and say, oh, well, there are a bunch of secondary dominance in um, body and soul, especially the, the A sections, right? So there, you know, we got into you know, so I might say, okay, well, if we identify all the chords in the key of D flat, we have D flat, Major, E flat minor, F minor, G flat major, E flat seven, B flat minor, C half diminished. So D flat is minor. So why does this tune go have a major third? B flat dominant seven, and there's a B flat minor chord in it. So some folks that might that might that whole secondary dominant idea might already be um, in, in in their awareness, but um, that's that's where that that comes from. So the E flat minor is the two chord, and we're going to this to this, okay? Because we want to feel this. It gives it more gravity, right? So we have, as opposed to, and and this is another thing I would encourage you to do. This is more like practice ideas and concepts. But take this and just say, what if I did play a B flat minor? I mean, that's not the change, but I want to hear what the difference is. So, okay, B flat really changes the character of it. So. So there's the actual change with the B flat seven. So that's where we get into the um, secondary dominance and um, and closely related keys. So that's um, especially on the part two, um, we talked quite a bit about the um, not only secondary dominance, but we actually spent a little bit time of time at the end talking about um, medians and chromatic medians. So that whole concept is to, is to take something like, I think we did the example in C because it's easier, but so a submedian would be below, so that's like a third below, and if it's diatonic, it's in the key. So it's like, okay, that's... You can hear it's a, it's it's a similar sound. It's not um, a hugely different sound. Now if we go to the median, that's that would be like F minor. Right? Okay. Um, but what if we, you know, sometimes a tune might might go to um, to a submedian, but change the quality of the chord, really just for the RL effect of that. Right? So then we can kind of say, well, you know, where, where does that all come from? Or we could go up to, let's say F, make it F major. So we started talking a little bit about the parallel minor. And we say, okay, there the submedian is A major C sharp minor, A major seven, or above it, uh, E major seven. So talking about closely, closely related keys.
keys. So we're talking about um, parallel minor, uh, which if you don't know the meaning of that, that that is just meant to mean that you take a D flat, in this example, D flat, change my screen here. Let's say a D flat major. Okay. And so the parallel would have to start from the same, but it would be minor. And quite a few different minor type scales. Quite a few major scales too, but um, I think we talked a little bit more about that um, earlier in the week. So um, uh, we talked about the uh, flat nine dominant uh, dominant flat nine pentatonic, and the um, and to minor, and then the, the first one talk to you in, in major. So um, the dominant pentatonic and um, sort of how, how I might talk about these is, is there's, I think, maybe a little bit of a preference as far as um, pentatonic scales. Um, some folks just kind of gravitate towards the um, the minor perspective and some more of the major perspective on it. So, so a dominant pentatonic is a lot like the, um, the, the so the major, it's a lot like the major pentatonic, but we have, instead of a six, we have a flat seven. So. So it's really useful for dominant seventh chords, as you can imagine. And then we start altering that in different ways. So, so we get the flat nine, so we lower this and keep everything else the same. So that can be um, uh, really helpful, uh, really useful. Um, so. Um, another perspective on that, if you if you tend to prefer the the minor um, perspective, the the same scale. If you start from G, it's like a minor pentatonic, but instead of the flat seven, you get six or so a minor six pentatonic. Same collection, same same five notes. Okay. And then um, um and then altering altering that one tone. So this is actually pretty pretty cool too for um so you could take this sort of sound, which you could use on um on the two five. Another is is maybe even thinking about kind of like a C flat nine sus sort of sound, which is kind of cool. I don't want to too too far off topic here, but um, that one's pretty easy to arrive at if you're if you're um, going from the minor sort of perspective. So you would take a minor pentatonic and flatten the fifth, which you're probably already doing if you know the blues scale, so. Okay. So we talked a little bit about um, that early on and what we did there was um, took, we had two fingerboard um, diagrams and we we looked at um, at comparing and moving from from one to the next so that we can go to minor or we can go to major so 
So with that pentatonic scale, you can really um, um, fit in you know, the um, um, that six or or the flat flat six. So you you can um, work with that. So let's say we're going to five. Let's say we're in the key of three flats. Five of six. Let's say. So you have a dominant pentatonic, but maybe you want to mix in this tone. So. Maybe that. So you're thinking about a dominant seven with a flat thirteen, and then if you're going to let's say, so it's kind of the same forms, right? Um, going to E flat major. Uh, then you might say, okay, I'll do the dominant pentatonic flat nine, but have a natural 13. So. Okay, and then, and then to the one chord. All right, so. See where we are. I'll check in on my uh, page here. All right, so I'm gonna hang out here for a few more um, minutes. So you talk about a few more things and uh, end it here about uh, quarter quarter till or so. And so um, that's a bit of a summary on um, or a review of everything, or at least most of the things that we did and um, covered this week. So maybe I'll give some updates on some things. So um, so the shorts, my goal is to do that much more often. And that's not even based on the um, kind of success of that video um, on confirmation. That's just based on a, on a goal that I've been trying to work towards. Um, and so um, I just want to work out a little bit. I like the spontaneous in the room audio. Um, I felt it might have been a little bit low volume. So um, uh, I plan to kind of sort that out. Um, another thing I, I noticed when I, I, I tested some with the arch top um, is that even though I was plugged in and I was hearing mostly the uh, speaker, so I had a speaker monitor kind of behind me, um, when I listened back, the audio is picking up the guitar from the front. So I heard, actually heard the arch top even more clearly than um than the other uh than the speaker so that is not ideal um because i'm i'm trying to work out tone like how much uh, reverb is appropriate maybe some delay so i'm trying to kind of shape that speaker sound and then for the microphone to not pick up all that um you know kind of polished elements to the tone um, is a little frustrating, at least from my perspective. But I think part of the appeal of these shorts is that it's somewhat somewhat raw and just, just in the room. Although I did see some pretty polished um, uh, shorts uh, from other channels. So who knows, maybe there's an opportunity to mix that in. But i um, thinking it should be fairly reasonable goal to you know, play a little bit live. Um, daily I'd like to um, and just do a one minute video or a mini lesson or something. Um, but one of the challenges I'm I'm kind of thinking about or trying to sort out with that is that and even on that video it just you know I was like maybe a second or two away from finishing a line the final line <laughs> it cut it off so um that's the prob that's problematic. Um, 
So if there was a little more leeway, that'd be really nice, but um, that's okay. It is, it is what it is. Um, so I think it's a little funny to just like play and for it to randomly cut off at some point. So, so that's a little bit of a problem. So maybe I'll do a, a little bit of like talking and then maybe check out this 15 little seconds of something, um, or maybe a lick or, or, or whatever. So, um, so we'll see, see what happens with that. All right, everybody. Thanks for checking out this video and I'll see you all in the next one.